when the head of the table office phoned me yesterday and said I was chosen to speak here, I told him that they were putting a heavy body on my shoulders. Honorable Speaker, my colleague, members of the National Assembly, Your Excellency the President, Your Excellency the First Lady, Your Excellencies Lady Chilel and Lady Njemi, Cabinet Ministers, my Lord the Chief Justice, members of the Supreme Islamic Council and the Christian Councils, service chiefs, all other protocols duly observed. That every death is a book that reminds us something fundamental. And that is, that is the ultimate reality of our existence. There are those among us who are mortals but there are also those among us who are immortal. Mortals come into this world and depart without leaving a trace. Those are those who live almost like animals in this world and go and leave no trace in the world. Immortals are those who stamp the world with their stamp. Some would put it parabolically as leaving indelible footprints on the sands of times. Those are the people who live their lives in the service of others. And if they are believers in God, they live in the service of God. Sir Kailaba Jawara was an immortal. This is not an ungodly language. It means that if you live in this world, if you don't want to die, you have to leave behind you something. There are people who have died centuries ago. They are living more now than those of us who are living, some of us who are living now. I do not give you, I do not need to give you examples. You know all the examples of such people who have perished hundreds of years ago, but they are more living now than those of us, some of us who are living now. Why? Because when they lived, they lived their lives in the service of others. They lived uh, their lives in the knowledge that they cannot be anything without others. And since you cannot be nothing without others, then you must live your life in the service of others. Sir Kairaba lived his life in that fashion. My first memories of him was as a child like this, when he was a veterinary surgeon. When he used to conduct Rindepest campaigns, Catholic inauguration, regularly, consistently, and efficiently. I would dare say that after, this, after his departure from the military service, I don't think anybody came who was so e effective as Saidawla was. Because in his time, no farmer ever attempted to inoculate his or her cattle which is the order after him. He was doing that effectively. And when he became a politician, it was an honor for him because truly PPP was not created by him. PPP was created and they looked for a leader. And he was not the only one they turned to there were others they turned to, some are living, some passed away. So that was an honor. He assumed the responsibility to lead that party. A party that I would dare say started badly. 
one of the members himself pointed to that fact here. It started badly, how? Because of the nomenclature. Party is an instrument of leadership and governance. So it cannot be regionally based or regionally oriented. But we must understand also the historical reasons of people's protected party. All the elections that took place in this country before 1960 were only concentrated in the capital and its surroundings. It was as if the protectorate never existed. As if you were not people part of this country. So when the party emerged in 1959, nobody should be angry that they called themselves protectorate people's party. Because they were coming from nowhere. But when he assumed the leadership of the party, the fundamental thought of the party changed. Because they knew, he knew that a party, a national party must yearn for national embrace, not a regional embrace. And that was his fundamental contribution to solidification of the PPP as a national party, which started by name, regionally. And when the first elections, which were based on universal adult suffrage, took place in 1960, his party won the majority of seats, but chiefs threw their, threw their lot on the side of the UP. And eventually, UD, UP formed the government, and P.S. Njai became the chief minister. He was appointed Minister of Education, Sir Dauda. Sifzize was appointed Minister without portfolio. We had that then in the, in, in the whole arrangement. People were appointed Ministers without portfolio. These political arrangements of party coming together has been a pattern of politics in this country from the beginning. But Sadara didn't stay long in the ministry as education minister. He resigned, followed by Sif Sise. And they asked for constitutional talks in London. In one of the meetings, he said, and I quote, the Gambia cannot remain any longer in the backwaters of African political advance while the whole continent moves to its destiny of freedom and self-determination." Unquote. The struggle there for a constitutional conference continued. Until 1961, they went for a conference which brought about the 1962 elections. And PPP emerged with the majority of seats. Of course, there was another policy possibility then which does not exist now, crisscrossing the carpet. Many crisscrossed the carpet over to PPP. Naturally, they had the majority and they formed the government. So from then on, we had the PPP in power for some 32 solid years. What we are here today for not only to pay homage to the man who contributed to the independence of this country, but also to learn from the challenges that he faced as a leader. Nobody would doubt I was small, but I knew he faced difficulties, and he had to weather storms to maintain his position as leader of PPP. I don't need to go into the details of what I mean, but those who are elders here knew what I know what I'm saying, what I'm referring to. He faced tremendous challenges. For reasons, some of which are customary, traditional, and the rest of it. But what impresses me about this man who lies, he's lying here, is his humility his tolerance. I emphasize his tolerance. That is one thing we must learn from this man. Tolerance. This man would be at a meeting and somebody would virtually insult him. 
but he would never, ever, he had never, ever asked anybody to arrest him or to do anything to him. He would ask them, leave him to say what he wanted to say. That is tolerance. That is a mark of leadership. People must be free to express themselves, of course, with respect. But you cannot teach people to be respectful unless you are respectful toward them. A leader must respect. A leader must be a model for the others to copy. He was that type of a leader. He was never angry with anybody. I grew up in the midst of these people. When I say these people, I mean the first generation of politicians in this country. By virtue of my relationship to my brother-in-law, who was also among them, al Haji Musa Dawo. I know all of you. And if he had gone by some of the suggestions that some of you were making to him before, he would have de declared this country a one-party state, but he refused. In fact, if he had so done so, some of you would not have formed your parties eventually. <laughs> so another mark, he was a Democrat. No, he was. A, I contested him in 1992 as a presidential candidate. You know that. And I had encounters with him. By the way, I'm linked to the Jawara family in many ways. He is a brother-in-law. I'm also a brother-in-law to him. My brother married his sister, and my niece, Lady Chiller, is married to him. Do you know why she is my niece? I was brought up by her grandfather, the mother, the father of his mother, Jada Mariama. He, she calls me uncle. And my wife was the hairdresser of the president's wife. So you see the, the link. My wife was his wife's hairdresser for years. And even my niece was also her hairdresser because I remember one time she came to us in Baka when I was teaching for a hairdo. And of course, the first wife was a friend. We met in a workshop where I had a very serious encounter with one British who was a medical doctor in the hospital who had a racist tint. And I think she was so impressed that eventually we became friends. And also, she was writing a novel whose chapter, at least based on North, in North Africa, she came to me for discussion. Sadawda also had another passion, sports. People think that the first book he wrote is Kairaba. No. So Kairaba Dawara's first book is on golf. I, 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 it's, it's a radar book, small book, but on golf. Golf was his passion. Those of who you here who ever played golf with, with him, there would attest to that fact. But to sum up, what we are here for today, not only to pay homage to this great man, but also to ask ourselves the question, the fundamental question. How are we going to deal with the challenges of nation building, learning from the example of this great man. What have we learned from him? And how are we going to implement what we have learned from him? One of which is tolerance. I emphasize tolerance. To conclude, I pray 
that Allah reward him abundantly. And I pray that those who survive him live long in good health and in prosperity. And I pray that this nation that he has bequeathed to us, we come together as a collective to address the task of nation building. That unless we are one, and unless we accept the fact that we have to be one, this small country, which is even less than the population of a city, will remain a problem in our hands. So the challenge he has left with us is a challenge of building this country, carrying forward from where he has stopped. I thank you very much for the honor and privilege you have given me to speak here.